Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this session. This session is on SMEs and absorptive capacity. So the topic we've been given, knowledge acquisition is cited as the most valuable task for internationalized firms. But all firms need new knowledge and skills, especially the small and medium enterprise sector. They cannot afford the extra salary to employ a knowledge manager. So how do they, how do their hard pressed staff acquire and convince other staff to deploy new knowledge? And there are a couple of questions I'll be asking as we go forward. So to introduce myself, my name is Ferdos Karas. I'm based in Ottawa, the capital of Canada. I'm originally from India and um, American educated uh, Canadian citizen who used to live for a while in Switzerland. So I've been around the world a bit. I, uh, for the last 27 years, have been engaged in a particular kind of knowledge transfer. I make uh, videos for social change, meaning to get people to change the way that they think or they act. And over the last uh, 27 years, I've done this uh, literally around the world. <clears throat> and I'm best known for my animated shorts on a wide variety of, uh, of uh, topics. And so uh, you can go on to my Vimeo channel and, and download and use any of my, uh, my work, which has been now used, as far as I know, in 198 countries. It exists in about 450 language versions and has been seen by well over a billion people, if not two billion. One billion, I'm sure about. Two billion is probable. Uh, and that's just one person sitting in his office. So I was joking earlier that this is about a panel about SMEs, but I'm actually an MSME, which is a micro uh, a uh, small and medium uh, enterprise. My company name is uh, Chocolate Moose, uh, but Moose, the animal, not Moose, the uh, the dessert, uh, Chocolate Moose Media. So with that uh, little introduction, I'm going to first turn it over to uh, our two distinguished panelists. There are supposed to be two other panelists. I hope that they join us. Uh, and if we do, I'll bring them online right away. But uh, in the meantime, we have uh, two panelists uh, with us today. So I'm going to uh, turn to Joe first, who is joining us from California to introduce the topic. Uh, are there uh, to talk about uh, the absorptive capacity, uh, knowledge based uh, knowledge dissemination and sharing and SMEs? Joe, over to you, please. Thanks so much. Um, it's good to be with people today. Uh, I'm, I'm Joe Herkin. I'm the CEO of Issue. We are a, a massive digital publishing platform. We enable marketers, content creators to make their content digitally available in a range of different formats to share and distribute to wherever their audience happens to be on whatever channel they're consuming that content. So we enable you to take your catalogs, marketing collateral, brochures, uh, publications, uh, make them digitally available and uh, whether it's video and link enhanced paginated versions or turn it into a gift to be shared uh, across social visual stories, article stories, a whole range of content. So you can create content once using whatever tools you want, including tools available on issue, and then transform that content into the right assets to share so that you don't have to constantly be creating native campaigns, native content for every channel where your audience happens to be. Uh, we ourselves, we, we cater primarily to SMBs or to groups within large companies. Uh, we are somewhere ourselves in the SMB world. We've got 140 people uh, at issue. So particularly when we look at the topic of this conversation, uh, we're, we're catering to companies that are in this space. And, and certainly I look at ourselves uh, in the same way. We, we cater to over a million companies, organizations globally every single year. Uh, and so our, our, we're used as one of the tools for efficiency uh, and, and, uh, and communication effectiveness. For, um, as, as I think about this topic, you know, I, I think generally SMEs are, are massively affected by competence one way or another uh, because whether it's 
an M SME uh, or or one of our size, you know, a uh, hundred plus people. Um, it's it's we're the kinds of organizations where essentially there are fewer people, obviously, than larger companies, and so that means there's less ability to have people on the team who are not contributing with their full capabilities or full capacities. And so facilitating ways in which people can really contribute is, uh, is super important. More importantly, companies want to have people whose contributions have a positive compounding impact. In, a, in an SME world, often you have one person who can do a particular task, who has one area of expertise. You don't have it spread out across uh, multiple people. So you want to be looking for people who have a compounding impact, meaning uh, they have the ability to start to synthesize and put ideas together that may be out of, out of bounds or out of scope of their specific job description, but are contributing in a really positive way. So I, I think it's really important to hire and train for impact and the ability to raise the bar, not just competence in the field. So we're not looking necessarily just for expertise. We're looking for culturally, uh, organizationally, can they raise the bar? Can they bring in both competence and the ability for others to uh, get better as well? As I look at the space uh, and, and think about this topic, I, I think there are essentially four areas of training. Um, there's skills related to the job to be done to increase competence and accountability. Um, uh, as an example, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, culture and company values, management training, and uh, colleague sharing. So in the first one, skills related to the job to be done. As examples, for our product managers, we have uh, people participate with a training organization called Reforge. And Reforge focuses primarily with product managers, but it's a subscription-based training that people all over the world can participate in. And Reforge uses people who are real experts in the field. They're they're uh, VPs of product management, VPs of growth, folks who have worked at companies that we've all seen and respect uh, and admire, and they come and teach real hands-on courses. And because it's digitally available, accessible to folks, it's a subscription model, it's relatively uh, cost-effective, which means that the people on my team get access to a wide range of experts that they wouldn't otherwise get um, and, and can build those relationships and really learn direct specific um, examples of what they have, how they can apply it to our business. Um, in terms of culture and company values, again, when we think about that compounded impact that we're looking for, we're not just looking for competence, we're looking for people who are able to really contribute and own the company values. Uh, a couple of examples of what we've done, um, we created a video at the beginning of the year where we're clearly sharing our, our strategy and key bets we're making this year and how that will impact our KPIs so that everybody in the company can be aligned and understand. We showed that video at the beginning of the year. We continue to do so with each new employee to make sure everybody's aligned. And then throughout the year, we're also revisiting it and tying it back to uh, what, we're, what we're delivering so that uh, people, again, aren't just checking the box and doing their job, but they're doing it for a purpose, for for the impact that they know the whole company is looking for, that then enables them this kind of training. Um, it triggers additional ideas that they may be uh, pursuing as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we lost Vanka. We may have. I had a couple other points, but <laughs> it may just be you and I. Uh, there he is. He's back. All right. All right. So re real quick, a couple other things. We we do interview training from HR with the people. Doing interviews um, to look for qualities that make a huge difference. Look for passion. Look for grit and tenacity. Ability to th synthesize. Again, it's looking for qualities and training people on the interview team how to look for qualities beyond just competence. Um, management training, specifically to the company. What does it mean to be a manager at issue? Is this example? What does it mean to be a manager at this company? What are the values that we want to be uh, reinforcing? I think the other key thing that we're working uh, hard on is how to manage through this current mobile, hybrid, remote workforce structure that so many companies are putting in place. Some are, are thriving with it, some are struggling with it, um, but it, it takes a, a, a different management skill set and capability to uh, be able to be effective in that in this environment. And then the other piece is, is uh, colleague sharing. So 
we, we, bring in, <clears throat> we bring in new colleagues to obviously grow and build the business. But one of the other things we're looking for is to raise the bar. As, a, as an SME, you often have people doing jobs, doing work for which they didn't have earlier expertise. And so they're doing the best they can, but they may not have uh, expertise. So we're able to bring in people who have real expertise in the areas where we're showing some level of growth and opportunity. It, it again, raises the bar in terms of expertise and capability. So we'll always be looking for that. The other thing that I do real quick is uh, we have office hours with the senior executives. So every week I just open up a Zoom instance and anybody from the company is um, able to join me, ask any questions they want. We do that for the, sa the same thing for our executive team. So we're leveraging the executive team's capabilities and experience for training purposes uh, ourselves. Okay, thank you very much, Joe, for that excellent introduction. Uh, there's a lot there to unwrap, and I'll come back to a few of your points. But before I do that, Venkat, you've been kind of uh, going in and out. Well, <laughs> you've just gone out again. Um, I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you can hear me still. Can you hear me? No. Um, let's wait for a second. Maybe he'll rejoin us. He must be having a problem with the connection. There yeah, is. yeah, yeah. Hi, you're having problems with connection. So my suggestion is to put off your video yeah. and uh, just stay on audio. Uh, that's fine. As long as you can hear us and we can hear you, we can go forward that way. It might be easier. Yes, Fidoza. And this is pretty unexpected. So sorry about that. I haven't, haven't gone through yeah. this before. Indeed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So yeah. anyway, over to you, Vankar, uh, to make your opening remarks, please. Absolutely, Fidas. And first of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, thank you once again to Harsis and Frank for continuing to persist through these difficult times and maintaining these conversations. I think that's, that in itself is quite remarkable. Uh, it's coming straight to the topic, Fidas. I think my association with uh, SMEs has been primarily in two different capacities. I primarily uh, see myself as a management advisor, a management consultant, and uh, have been in this space in different capacities over the last two and a half decades. Uh, of course, and therefore, uh, a significant portion of my association with SMEs has been advising businesses. Uh, but then uh, when you call SMEs in the Indian context or when you call small and medium businesses in the U.S. context, the numbers may be different. So when I say, when I refer to something as an SME, I'm talking of any, any organization which may have anywhere between 100 people to, let's say, 400 to 500 people. And when I was advising many of the SMEs, they were typically from the manufacturing side. So the, the workforce composition of many of those businesses are very significantly different. Uh, the other capacity that I have been uh, in the space of SMEs is I ran businesses. I ran some of them were family businesses. Some of them were uh, commercial businesses, uh, which a couple of friends got together and started. So it was in restaurants. It was in oil and gas. So unlike in U.S., where a gas station may have just one employee, in a typical Indian context, uh, at the peak, our, well, some of our gas stations used to have 40 employees. Uh, similarly, the restaurants, some of the restaurants used to have 75 to 80 employees and also ran a couple of impact organizations. And there, the uh, profile of the employees is pretty different. So I generally see three kinds of problems uh, when it comes to knowledge, because knowledge itself is also uh, very encompassing. And I'll quickly come to that. But generally speaking, depending on what's the profile of the workforce that that particular SME has been uh, deploying, it's either skills or competencies or behaviors. And uh, on all three counts, uh, depending on which space one is operating on, there are options, there are lack of options. But I think the significant uh, issue that I've seen is whether the individuals who are responsible for decisions around those SMEs, do they even understand uh, that there has to be some uh, intentional in attention given to knowledge? Another question is what is knowledge, right? Uh, and again, I'm oversimplifying this fairly complex uh, space. One is knowledge about the direction the business may take or knowledge about what might come and impact that business. Uh, and then unfortunately, many of the SMEs are hand to mouth. They do not have resources. They do go from working capital cycle to working capital cycle. So they do not have deep cushions and they may not be able to segue uh, maybe compared to many other large businesses who may have more valuable resources. That's one. The second is knowledge of the core operations itself. Assuming your operating environment is still the same and the business environment, policy environment, or competitive environment hasn't really sh significantly shifted, uh, maybe your technologies have changed. Or maybe uh, uh, you, know, you have assumed certain resources to be there 
and those resources are not uh, providing the same level of uh, productivity uh, and therefore how do you respond because your commitments haven't really changed so and therefore again there could be several more dimensions to what is knowledge and what kind of knowledge would need to be absorbed at what level and when but that being said i think i think where i'll give a pause is uh, much as we may think it's a solvable problem when i try to look at this whether as a consultant or as a owner of businesses at various points in time more often than not i saw helplessness in this space okay thank you venkat well let me make a few uh, comments of my own because uh, over the last 27 years i've been pounding the table on visual media uh, as the best way to get knowledge out and to this day i've been uh, frustrated quite often where international organizations international companies in particular still go the old route of uh, of knowledge uh, transfer which is mainly through books and pamphlets and brochures and uh, let me give you an example uh it, it, i think the best example i can think of is in, is in the ebola crisis that happened about 5 years ago in west africa and uh, millions of people uh, could have been affected uh, by it uh, and about 11000 people died as a result of the ebola outbreak and there was great reluctance in the international community to actually take action uh from when it first became evident uh, in march of 5 uh, years ago till the international community finally reacted and declared it an international crisis in august so several months passed and then they did what they typically do which is to create brochures and uh, and pamphlets to try and get uh, people to understand um uh how ebola is being transmitted and what they could do to uh, to not get affected and it it just completely startled me because uh, um it is uh, the literacy rate in some of the villages in africa was so low that to put out bro- uh, brochures and pamphlets and uh, and it, it just made no sense to me at all and so i created a video uh, on containing the ebola crisis as it happened which ultimately we put out in 17 different uh, local languages of west africa and as far as i know was watched by about 40 million uh, africans and it became uh, quite well known and it it was the first time i think that people started using mobile phones to gain their knowledge on a health crisis in africa it, it was a bit of a game changer and then since then we had of course the covid crisis about 2 years ago and the the way knowledge was has been transmitted from the decision makers which are generally uh, policy makers and government officials uh, and it's been so confusing i think is the best way to put it uh, i mean there've been massive amounts of uh, knowledge transfer attempts uh, by various people because they have been so many different messages coming out throughout the covid crisis for the last uh, say two and a half years um the amount of decision makers the amount of people providing information the amount of methods that we use to provide information quite often even within countries let alone between countries and between jurisdictions just amounted to a, a great deal of confusion so instead of knowledge being accurate knowledge being transferred authoritatively uh, by uh, senior people there was this just a plethora so one of the questions i want to ask you is that we all now have such diverse ways of getting knowledge uh, i mean the diversity has absolutely expanded uh, considerably and will continue to expand so with that comes diversity of views which means that the amount of uh, misinformation uh, or wrong uh, information false information is also increasing uh, how do uh, how do venkat you back how do smaller companies in particular 
uh, without uh, the the kind of filtration systems that maybe large organizations have. How do smaller companies deal with the plethora now of knowledge transfer that happens both both accurate knowledge and inaccurate knowledge? Joe, do you want to lead us on that question? Yes, I think there's a distinction between policy, political, cultural kinds of uh, information that's being distributed, the plethora of that, you know, fake news, false information, uh, all of those challenges. Uh, I, I think it's a different issue for companies. Um, I, think, I think companies have much less of that because you can organize the set of content that you want to make available for, for training purposes, for information purposes. So I, I think that there's much less of a challenge with whether it's authoritative or not. The larger challenge is, you, you know, I talked about we use Reforge. There are dozens, hundreds, thousands of pieces of material that someone could use for training to become an expert in, in product management. So I think it's important for um, for companies to try to say, look, he, here's the here here's two or three courses that we know of that will provide real expertise. Let's focus on those because part of what you're also looking for in a training it's not to control people, but it is to create a unified approach to the business. So you, you want to have alignment around. Hey, we're going to use these processes. We're going to use this. Uh, this structure, um, you know, often when people are building technology, you use agile so that everybody's on the same page. This is the way we're going to go build content. And you find the right two or three ways to learn and implement agile development in a company. Whether it's, uh, I, I agree with you. Um, it's not just about the books. It's about getting real practical hands on experience often videos are helpful there or bringing in expertise but again i think it's streamlining we're making a decision we're going to go with this process and then bringing in two or three pieces of content that support that if you have too many uh, opinions or too much content coming in then you just create chaos and and again you i think the the, the north star is what are we trying to do with this information we're trying to make sure that we're creating alignment we're enabling the people that we have in the company to have compounded contributions and compounded impact and what's going to facilitate that. Having disparate, uh, uh, disparate sort of ways of operating is often going to minimize the compounded impact you can have because people are spending their time arguing about things rather than getting alignment around it. Okay, thank you, Joe. So Martin, welcome to uh, our panel. Uh, glad you could join us. So why don't I give you two or three minutes to introduce yourself and to talk about the topic uh, at hand today, which is SMEs and absorptive uh, capacity. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, also, uh, welcome. Nice to meet you here. Uh, uh, it's Sorry, Martin. It's very difficult to understand what you're saying. Uh, Venkat, could you please uh, go on silent? Uh, just mute, mute yourself uh, for the moment. Thanks. Martin. Yeah, sort of. I tried to try closer to the mic. Okay, okay. So uh, my name is Martin McDonald. I'm the CEO of Mopash. And uh, we are in the Global Market. Sorry, I can't really understand what you're saying. Uh, do you have a microphone that you can get? No. Okay. Could you? Are you using your phone or something? Because what you could do is just bring bring it much closer to you. I think it's uh, having a having a problem because it's too far. Okay. Try it again. So my name is Martin Bell. I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Hotfish, and we help brands and organizations get into the market. I'm the marketing research firm of Unity Lights. 
I can't understand anything you're saying. Uh, can anybody else understand, Joe? No. No. no doesn't equal. Sorry, Mark. We can't, we can't understand what you're saying. So uh, my suggestion would be to put out the video uh, and bring the microphone as close to your mouth as possible. Okay, I will do that. Is connection better now? Try. Okay. My name is Arvind. Um, yeah, we can't can hear you. No. Uh, Martin, we'll, we'll, I'll go to Venka uh, for a minute and then we'll come back to you. Um, uh, hopefully, you can work out the uh, speaker. Uh, and the mic uh, problem. Okay, Venka, uh, could you please uh, go forward from uh, Joe's point? Yes, absolutely. And just just a forewarning uh, for the house is uh, since my video is off, when I mute, my uh, my block also vanishes. But then I am able to see both of you at all times. I so just wanted to be sure that to let you know that I'm pretty much in the conversation. Great. All right. Now, specific to, I know, uh, how do you process information? Right, and I, I would probably say once again two things: generic information and specific information. I'll give you a very specific example for one of our gas stations. At that time, I was in India. Yeah, you might be aware that there was a time when the government of India decided to demonetize the entire currency, uh, especially the top two currencies uh, in the nation, and yes. and there were only uh, very specific businesses which were provided a window of I think about three or four weeks where that particular currency was still valid. One of them was gas stations. And here's where I had about 35 employees who were working in three different ships. And uh, they suddenly were in a very new environment because the whole population suddenly has a very different expectation of them to now take those currencies. And then there were fantastic rules on behalf of government of India to keep a record of those currencies, which vehicles and which individuals they came from. And uh, uh, the whole nation was gripped of this once in a lifetime kind of circumstance. And then here's where we had to maintain normalcy. And we also had to give certain uh, comfort to the employees. Many of them were skilled labor. They probably didn't even have uh, a full education to probably read things and understand things on their own. So many times you have to process that information for the employees and tell them whether it's relevant to them, it's not relevant to them. And therefore, the point is who processes that information? I think especially for SMEs and SMBs, I feel that uh, relevant, relevance and interpretation is a lot determined by who is a decision maker in the SME. And I, that's where I also believe that the leadership, whatever will be the nature of this leadership within small and medium enterprises, they need to intentionally set aside time to, uh, to, pre to present information to the employees, which the employees may or may not have even seen. And where information has already been made apparent to them, interpret that information for them. I think that's very important. Uh, much as we may want to, because chances are usually, even if it's an SME, which has 10 or 20 people, chances are the owners are probably better educated and they have, may have better access. So they may have a relatively better grasp of things. And again, this is generic information, or this could be information which may be beyond generic and may potentially impact the immediate business. But once again, uh, how do I, for example, uh, uh, train my employees uh, on a new way of doing business? And if they have certain insecurities about uh, if the new way of doing business can have an impact on the, on, on the, on the future of their jobs. So I think, I think once again, I think I'll come to the same point as uh, information, relevance of the information and interpreting the information. The, the responsibility once again lies on leadership. And to the extent that the leadership of the organization is aware of these kind of aspects, that would be great. Now, the question is, what will you do with SMEs where the leadership may not be aware of this? How do you process those circumstances? And, and that's why I always kind of come back to this issue more in terms of helplessness. We do not know how many organizations do not know what they do not know. I think, I think that's where we need to bring in uh, maybe a governmental information, governmental support system, wherein uh, uh, certain blind spots can be made apparent to SMEs. And now the question is, how do you bring those blind spots to the knowledge of SMEs? Who in the SMEs can they be uh, brought, uh, you know, who, who can be made aware of? 
uh, how do you access those SMEs? Who speaks with those SMEs? Who has credibility amongst those SMEs? So these are these are those questions. I I would say I've experienced many of these problems myself. Do I have all the solutions? Unlikely. Uh, but there's only one thing I can confidently say with all my experience in this space is uh, I do believe that information processing needs to have a response within SMEs, but I also believe that response may or may, or may not sit within the SMEs. Okay. So let me ask you a, a generalized question uh, since you brought it up already. Uh, the role of government in, mm-hmm. in, uh, in training uh, mm-hmm. And the role, perhaps, of educational uh, associations and, and institutions. Mm-hmm. For example, in 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 Europe, mm-hmm. uh, it's almost free to go to university, if not free, in certain countries if you're a citizen of that country. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other extreme is uh, the private universities in the U.S., uh, where it's extremely expensive and difficult to get into. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have this kind of, even in the West, you have this kind of... Uh, Total, and I think Canada is somewhere in between. You have mm-hmm. this uh, this kind of total, um, um, you know, dichotomy on how important formal education and training is within universities or within community colleges and so on. Uh, mm-hmm. And I want to know what is the role of uh, government in subsidizing. Uh, training uh, either through universities or directly with companies. Do you think governments have a role? Venka, you touched on this a little bit. Why don't you take us forward? Yes, I do believe government has a role, but I also would like to uh, share a word of caution. Uh, and again, I'm speaking very specific to the Indian context. This may not apply in the European context or the American context. In the Indian context, if you really look at a lot of the manufacturing SMEs, many of the skill gaps may not even be addressable by universities. Universities may not be even able to connect to the level of skill gaps, which many of the SMEs may require. So I would probably think that bringing universities to solve this problem would be an overkill because they will not understand. And I myself am from the university system for the last eight years. And I've I've been with the Canadian university system and the North American university system. And of course, I've taught in the Indian context as well. I've understood universities and the capabilities. And I can tell with fair degree of confidence that there's, uh, there's a very deep chasm between what SMEs require and what universities can provide. That being said, I do want to uh, bring attention to a very interesting initiative, for example, the government of India took, and I feel how that can uh, significantly support SMEs, which is about identifying a specific set of products within each district, which is equivalent of a county in the U.S. context. What should that particular district focus on in terms of production? And I see that there's a fantastic upside there because what you're essentially trying to do is you're creating very local ecosystems which are centered around specific products or specific services. And if what you're trying to do by by that policy intervention is you're mobilizing the entire government machinery uh, to to respond to that scale at, at a local level. But that being said, since that particular district is focusing on a few products, you create a natural circumstance for maturity of certain skills or it may make economical sense for many service providers to come in there and bring in uh, skill development services which can still be addressed at a cost point which many of the SMEs can uh, afford. For example, uh, let's say uh, in a district they decided that they're going to process apples and convert that apples into some sort of maybe processed product. Let's say. Now, maybe now uh, that Opportunity has suddenly brought in four or five member SMEs to bring in their talent and provide a specific layer of service in the overall value. Let's say. And let's say now one of the component of that is I don't know how to dry apples. Now, which university can teach a five member organization how to dry apples? But if I'm the only family trying to do that in the next 200 miles, I'll not be able to figure out how to learn. But if I'm now part of a district or a county wherein that's the local ecosystem, that's where the local business is focusing significantly on. If not the initial year, at least six or seven years down the line, I could probably just walk across two streets and get somebody to teach me how to do that. I think that's where uh, systemic interventions can create con- conditions for SMEs to uh, intuitively succeed. Okay, thank well, you. Uh- I, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, you look at places like Silicon Valley, and one of the reasons why Silicon Valley is as successful as it is is because of the 
the community that's been created. It's the, the ecosystem. And so people are able to connect with others, whether in, in, this, in the same company or elsewhere, um, you're, there's, there's a very close proximity of people with expertise. And there's a natural sense of people connecting with each other. Networking is a, is a, is a big piece. There's, a, there's real value. It's a huge learning component to networking. And so that ecosystem matters. In terms of government participation, um, you know, I think, I think government can do a lot to help facilitate the creation of companies, uh, make sort of remove barriers to creation of organizations, uh, remove barriers to challenges that may exist with, with uh, hiring or, or bringing people into countries who, uh, who have a particular expertise. Uh, immigration kinds of, of, of areas. Um, certainly governments do provide some training and capability uh, in terms of, uh, of information, but I, I think often for an SME to be successful, a lot of it is, is determined by the people in the organization and the places you're getting that training from, one of which can be government organizations, but it's, I don't think it's the responsibility of the government to make sure that SMEs are properly trained. Okay. So in the environment going forward now, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a lot of uh, pessimism in the economy, uh, certainly in the world. Uh, stock markets are going round, uh, down around the world. Interest rates are going up. Inflation has gone up. Um, there's a war going on in Europe, which hasn't happened for many years. Um, which is having a huge impact, uh, not just uh, locally, but indeed around the world. So uh, how do SMEs prioritize uh, going forward? How much uh, should they be prioritizing on training? How much, uh, I mean, quite often, I think CEOs uh, dump training as one of the first things to go uh, when they're having uh, economic uh, headwinds uh, that they're facing. Uh, what do you think about uh, about the future? How are SMEs going to be coping, and what is the role of training within that uh, ability to cope? Joe, profitability. Uh, businesses need to get to profitability and figure out how they're going to stay there. And you know, in, in an environment like this, the companies that have cash and have a a, a, a roadmap at least toward profitability are the ones that are going to be successful. The ones that are constantly having to raise money and are just spending money uh, to, to grow are going to be, are going to be the most challenged in terms of training employees. Um, this is the time again, when you can identify those training programs that are going to provide that compounding effect of impact. You want to keep supporting that because this is the time like no other, when that impact matters, you need to be able to start synthesizing ideas and figure out, how is your company going to be able to uh, grow revenues? How are you going to be able to increase engagement with, with your, your customers? You know, in these kinds of challenging times, certainly plenty of, of businesses, particularly SMEs, go out of business. It's actually, I think, if we, if we look back, particularly the last few decades, these are the times when the most innovative, creative companies get formed and where there's huge opportunities. So, yeah, there's challenges, but if you look at, you know, look at the, you know, the small businesses that came out of the 2008 downturn, you know, you look at Airbnb, the founders of Airbnb were looking to, to, to stay on people's sofas as a way to save money because we we're in the midst of a massive economic downturn and a, you know, tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars valued company grew out of one person sleeping on someone's couch. So the challenges that we are facing right now globally are going to facilitate some really interesting businesses, some of which will stay small but will be uh, productive, others of which will become, become massive. But I think for all SMEs in the midst of all of this, make sure you have a path to profitability. That's where you're going to get uh, – that's where you're going to be able to be sustainable. So I would say you know, get training on that and continue to facilitate training – that is going to enable your employees to be uh, to be more effective, more efficient, and to contribute in ways that are directly impacting the goals of the business. Okay, Venkat, please. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I think uh, you know, the best way I can explain this is take an example right now here in US, uh, the labor availability and the cost of labor, right? Let's say you have four hotels, which are in the same, which are in a, which are in a similar proximity. And each of those hotels, let's say has over 15 staff, different kind of staff who are there to maintain that particular hotel. Now you're roughly talking of 60 individuals between those four assets. Now, all the four properties would be struggling for labor as well as the cost of labor is increasing. But then they also understand that business is also dipping. So there's a bit of a flex in the business. And that's why I would say it, it would be smart for SMEs to actively consider co coalitions and collaborations. They explain if the four, hotel four, four hotels could come together and say, you know what, 30% of my staff would be shared staff. And uh, so if I create a special purpose vehicle to accommodate that, let's say, uh, let's say about 30 of the staff members and they get deployed on a, on a particular day of the week to different hotels, then what you're trying to do is as such in a typical world, you would have competed and you would not have let employees uh, transactionally move across businesses on a daily basis. But then you may have to get into some of these ways to, to survive and respond. And that's where SMEs can also create new vehicles. They can create new services. And and that kind of a collaboration or a coalition can be taken to any level. And you could actually have a coalition of, let's say, 50 manufacturing SMEs in one cluster, wherein they say this coalition, which is funded by 50 SMEs, all of us independently could, could not have sustained it economically, but all of us are going to collectively invest in a sort of a training or a competency or excellence organization. And this uh, organization will deliver training services or skill-based services to all my 50 SMEs. And that's where we have to really think of how these coalitions can work. Chances are at least to kickstart it, it would be great if some of the industry bodies or trade bodies or even government can come in and create those environment, create at least a proof of concepts. But I do believe that eventually you need to share resources. When resources become expensive, the most logical thing for you to do is share and try to spread this resource even more. Okay, thank you. We only have uh, three minutes left. So, Joe, do you want to uh, wrap up for us uh, with your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think I've, I've shared most of, most of what I want to focus on uh, today, but I'll, I'll just reinforce it. Um, you, you want to be looking for sort of, if we, if we boil it down, there's, there's two aspects of training. There's uh, obviously increasing competence and doing so in a way that provides access to uh, the, the, the expertise that's going to provide useful information that people can apply immediately. Often that is because of... of um, of, of you know the dispersed uh, way that we're working these days, um, mobility it's it's available through video or through Zoom or uh, you've in many ways you have access to expertise that you didn't have before. Um, so focus on that. And then the second is get training in place at a cultural and values level so that everyone on the team is aligned and able to deliver against what we're shooting for uh, for goals in the company. It's it's a uh, it's super important. That has, again, profound compounding effects. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I do a lot of my work on creativity and on cultural uh, organi within uh, organizations. Uh, Venkat, uh, your final thoughts, please. Yes, with us. Uh, I think simplifying our thinking and questioning our assumptions. I think that would be very vital, uh, especially in these changing times. Uh, if we all assume that business was being done this particular way, it has to be done the same way going forward. I don't think that's going to work. Now, the question is, how do we do that? Uh, I normally see consultants, including me, who we tend to overcomplicate solutions, uh, especially for the SME environment. It's very important to keep your MBAs outside your door and think in a very ground up level. I think that's very important. Simplifying the thinking and responding to the need at, on the ground level, I think that's very important. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank both of you very much on behalf of Rasus. And uh, I, I'm sorry that the other two panelists didn't join us, but uh, thank you for carrying an extra burden for us uh, today and uh, contributing uh, to this uh, very important conversation. So uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Venkat, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you.